Hello everybody and welcome back. My name is Jennifer McCarrow. I'm the Strategic Programme Manager for Scotland Excel, so I lead in our work in social care. This session is the Q&A session following on from the session we had on future policy direction in social care, uh, which we had this morning before the coffee break. Our speakers have returned from the first session and they're all ready to answer your questions. So a very warm welcome to Anna Kydeson and Joanna MacDonald from Scottish Government, to Jane O'Donnell from COSLA, Annie Gunnar Logan from CCPS, Cleland Sneddon, the Health and Social Care Lead from Solis, John Trainer from Renfrewshire, and we also have Julie Welsh, who did the introductions this morning. She's going to join the panel and be ready to answer your questions. And as Julie mentioned this morning, we have a new addition, which is Toria Fraser from Scottish Government, who's joining to give us our expertise in the, the adult social care landscape. So uh, just to carry on from the football references this morning, I'm going to liken this group to sort of the social care equivalent of your fantasy football dream team. So I think it's not often you get this group all around the virtual table, so we need to make the most of it. And I, I really encourage you to be interactive with us and ask lots of questions. I do have housekeeping things just to remind you very briefly. So your microphones have been muted. Please keep your cameras off for bandwidth restrictions unless you're asking a question. If you want to ask a question, you can either type it in the chat box and I will read it out for you. Preferably, though, it would be nice if people were willing to put their virtual hand up and ask the questions themselves. If you're going to do that and you're invited to speak, the conference team need to enable your microphone first. You then need to take yourself off mute as well. Once you've asked your question, if you would please uh, put yourself back on mute and lower your hand just to keep the, the, away from the echoes and things. And to remind everybody, this session is being recorded and will be made available on the Academy after the conference. So without further ado, um, I'd like to open the forum for, for your questions, queries, comments, for our illustrious panel, if anyone wants to stick up their virtual hand and kick us off. Otherwise, I've got one or two suggestions from this questions we had this morning. We've got one, Thomas Patterson. So Robin, if you could unmute Thomas. And you can pose the question to the panel, Thomas. Um, good morning, folks. Um, Thomas Patterson, Principal Officer in Mental Health Commissioning in Glasgow City. Um, first of all, thanks to everyone for some really interesting um, presentations this morning um, and some thought provoking stuff. Um, perhaps not unsurprisingly, um, I'm Annie Logan is who I'm going to direct this at um, following her very thought provoking um, discussion earlier. So, Really, Annie, um, on the idea of um, pressing pause on further competitive tendering, um, I mean, that's a, that is a bold thing to say. Um, I, I just wondered, in saying that, what consideration has been given to um, the requirement for service development where there is need? So where there's a strategic need to, to deliver um, social care services in a different way than we currently have them. By pressing pause, things stay the same. What happens when the same isn't working? Thanks, Thomas. Over to you, Annie. You just need to unmute yourself. Yeah. Hi. Thanks, Here's Jennifer. And thanks, uh, Thomas. Can you hear me now? Is that OK? Yeah, we've yeah. got you. Thank you. Um, yeah, pre press pause is a kind of a, a radical suggestion, but uh, it, we need radical change here. Um, I, I would kind of push back on that a little bit, Thomas, by saying, well, what, what is the strategic need that you have? Uh, you know, if you've got a service or a set of services which are so terrible that you actually need to retender them immediately, you know, look at how you commissioned them and procured them in the first place and, and look at the impact that that had on uh, the outcomes that you're getting. You know, what, what, what is the strategic need for procurement? Is it because, you know, your standing orders say that every three years you have to do this? Is it because uh, there are other providers who are coming along and challenging you? You know, why do you need to retender it? Why can you not wait, say, 12 months while we all get our heads together and think of a better way to do this and develop a better way to do this? Um, that, that's what I would kind of respond to, really. Thanks. So I don't know Thanks. if you want to come back on that straight away. Are we allowed to have a one to one here, Jennifer? Is that? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, uh, Thomas, if you want to come back on that, absolutely. Yeah, of of, of course, Annie, and, and um, 
I, I, I think some of your points there are c completely valid and in, in, in tendering for tendering sake and um, sticking to our standing orders as of course a consideration for commissioners. In some cases though, um, and I'm, I, I'm sure with your experience you understand that um, needs change in a city like Glasgow needs change sometimes very quickly. So um, notwithstanding the areas that you highlighted, there is sometimes a requirement to, to, to move quickly on things and m moving quickly when you've you've put the appropriate level of planning and consultation and collaboration into a process in the first place. So, Yeah, and I think things that are, that are already in train would, would obviously have to run, but I'm talking about, you know, new, new procurements now, new tenders, you know, press pause, on all of that. Um, I mean, if you, if you look at the procurement guidance on social care, which I'm sure is imprinted onto everybody's brains here, it certainly is on mine, um, it, it's, it's very, very clear that if you have, uh, if you don't have an issue with outcomes, if you don't have an issue with quality, if you don't have an issue with the provider you've got at the moment, if you're, if things are okay at the moment, then just leave it alone. You know, you don't actually have to retender at all. Uh, it, it, that isn't a new thing. I'm saying I want to do something radical here, but actually, if you look at the guidance, you've got plenty of permissions to let contracts run ahead anyway and even extend them if there isn't a problem. I absolutely agree with you. If there is a problem of quality, if there is change needs, if but I think you have to make a business case for that. And again, the guidance is very, very clear that if you can make a solid business case for doing what you want to do, whether it's not tendering or whether it's going ahead with tendering, then you're fine. What what we object to really is this is this kind of assumption that after a certain period, everything will be retendered, regardless of whether there are quality issues or provider issues or anything else. It's just a thing that we do because we've got used to doing it. So that's the thing we want to stop. Um, but I think where something is already in train and you've done the collaborative work and you can demonstrate that it's all in accordance with the guidance and people have been consulted and users have had their say and all of that kind of stuff, uh, you know, then then by all means, let it let it run. It's it's just the kind of routine stock tendering and cyclical retendering that we think, you know, the time has come just to stop that now. Thank you, Annie, and thank you, Thomas. I think um, for me, certainly, Annie, you've, you've hit the nail on the head with that point about the automatic assumption of, of retendering. And I think that's where the, the crux of it, really, for me personally, is understanding where that needs to happen because it's the right thing to do and circumstances where actually um, continuing with your existing arrangements is the right thing to do um, and not have that, that automated assumption. Um, but I, I mean, I, I think we would, some of us would probably not also go for the automated assumption of a pause. Uh, I think we would we would want to, people to be making uh, decisions on a case by case basis based on our circumstances they, they face. So sorry, I'm I'm uh, jumping in there. But is any of our my panel members uh, keen to come in on that? Anna, thank you. You've got your hand up. Would you like to respond as well? Yeah, just to say that I don't disagree with anything that's been said um, already this morning. But I think we all need to acknowledge that whatever new looks like in terms of the setting up of a care service, etc., is going to take time, at least 18 months, because legislation will be required. And it's really important to me that we demand improvements of the current system now. It's not appropriate for us to sit and wait 18 months to deliver some of the improvements that Philly has asked for. Um, so I think we need to be thinking about that. That might mean some short-term retendering where services aren't performing. It might mean that at a local level we, need, we may need to reconsider need or how we're addressing need through contracts. Um, but, but, but all of you as commissioners of services right now, I would encourage you to look at the contracts you have and make sure that the outcomes we are seeking for people are being met are we ensuring that through the, the administration of public funds, those, those contractors are supporting the requirement to, to demonstrate human rights on behalf of the public sector? Are we doing all of those things right now appropriately? What can we do before we might or may or may not see system change? A consultation will, will, will review that, but we need to start now. Uh, and that's what we're doing a lot of talking about right now. What are the interim immediate improvements we can make? And we should not be excluding commissioning and procurement from that discussion. 
Um, can I can I come back on that, Jennifer? Because I think that is absolutely critical. But you know, from from my perspective, our organisation has been asking for change in commissioning and procurement for the last twenty years, and it still hasn't happened. So you know, I I don't think we can just kind of expect this is going to spring out of nowhere, <laughs> um, and suddenly after twenty years of doing the wrong thing, we're all going to start doing it right. Um, and one thing that I would add to that is services are sometimes not performing precisely because because the terms of the contract make it impossible to perform. Um, I mean, we, we've had data going back for two or three years now that one, one in three, one in three third sector providers have walked away from a contract in the last couple of years, simply because the terms of the contract make it not just unsustainable, but not viable in the first place. So that's the kind of stuff that we've been banging on about forever. And I totally agree with you, Anna, that we can't wait. But I think we need something quite radical to give this a push, because we've been talking about it for decades and it's never happened yet. So we need a real catalyst to make people start thinking about this and change it. And I think that's what the press pause recommendation is all about. Thanks, Annie. I think you're clearly articulating the, the extent of the challenges that, that, that faces. Um, and I think Jane was quite keen to come in on that. Jane, if you wouldn't mind, thanks. Thanks. I've got a bit of delay coming off pause there, so apologies for that. And I'm going to be very brief because I know there's other questions to ask, answer as well. I guess um, absolutely. So so hopefully I set out the cause of position just to reaffirm it. Our politicians are really clear that we're not waiting to start making a difference. We start doing it now as soon as possible. I'm very thoughtful about colleagues locally being empowered to make the right decisions for their communities and the people that they support. Um, so it's, it's about making sure that we're, we're, we're allowing those local decisions to take place and that the people that are on this call, the professionals that are on this call, feel like they can make the right decision for the communities that they serve. But COSLA are absolutely in a place of, let's start making the changes we can make right now. Let's, let's not wait for legislation. That seems like a, a, a false a false thing to do. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Appreciate that. Certainly sounds like the panel are all in agreement with it, that, that we have um, still work to be done and um, that some of this needs to be done quite urgently. We've got chat in the box um, from Julie also confirming that we need, we need to do more. Can I invite then a, a new question from the, the group? I think Karen Quinn, you had your hand up. Hi, yeah, thank you. I do. Um, it's really just to pick on the points that have been raised as well and everybody's putting on a very good case and I agree with Ari because my background is coming from social work but I'm now a procurement officer. I am currently working on renewing a contract uh, for Glasgow City Council but I have a partnership included in that with six other uh, local authorities as well. Now the hindsight is that we, yes I am practically rewriting it because it didn't quite viable as we say, to carry out the service it was required to do so. This does need to be renewed, and I know you want to put a stop on this, but as a matter of health and safety and developing, and with R&D continually innovating, that new things are coming on, new products are coming on the market for care and community, that we do need to provide another service to encapsulate everything that has moved, and service users needs and abilities are always changing so therefore they require community equipment continually to change around them to give them the service that they require. Um, Sorry. To say, uh, <clears throat> Sorry. Yeah. No it was just to say that I, I really don't think we should put a pause on something that needs to be rewritten because services are always changing. Thanks, thanks, thanks for that point, Karen. So I, th I think where where we're going with that is um, that um, clearly, in order to take advantage of innovation and change and potential for things to be improved, we need to revisit and and go back to the market and look at our, and look at our solutions and our options on a, on a regular basis. Um, and I suppose I, I guess the point there is that Karen suggesting that if we um, if we pause all procurement activity, that there might be a loss of some of that. So I don't know if Annie, did you did you maybe want to come back in in respect of that point? 
Well, I just put the, the question in the chat, you know, who, who's asking for this contract to be rewritten? Who's asking for something different? Is it the people who use the service? If so, fine. If not, just don't do it. Thanks, Annie. That's a very, very clear cut, <laughs> very clear cut solution uh, there from Annie. Anyone in the panel want to come in in response to uh, this point or will we move on to a new question? OK, thanks, folks. Um, anyone want to raise their hand and ask the panel a new question? So in a different area, there was a lot of uh, material covered this morning. I'm sure it would be of interest to explore a bit further. OK, well, Jennifer, oh, we Jennifer. have got one from James. Oh, James, if you could uh, go ahead. Sorry, I couldn't hit the uh, un unmute button there. Um, morning, everybody. So I I'm a commissioner within um, Sterling and Client Manager Health and Social Care Partnership. Um, I was also a carer for disabled young people for a number of years for a third sector organisation. Um, the one thing that I felt when I read the promise that was missing was a focus on children with disabilities. It is mentioned um, under intensive family support and there are a lot of general principles, um, but we have you know, a large number of, of children with disabilities who are perhaps not experienced in the sense that they're looked after and accommodated, if you use that kind of slightly older term, um, but are certainly a huge priority for us locally looking at things like uh, the diagnosis or increasing diagnosis of autism. Um, so it's it's not really been focused on this morning, it's not been spoken a lot about, but when we talk about early intervention and prevention and, and trying to bring the agenda forward, even in consideration of the transition of families from children to adult services, there's a real pressure on families in that moment when they're looking at their children coming out of education, moving into adult services and a bit of an unknown for young people uh, about what, what that will look like. Um, it's just it's an observation for me perhaps this morning just to say um, we can't lose their voice, which I appreciate, you know, there's perhaps different challenges rather than care and protection. But how do we ensure that when we're talking about these things, children with disability are not lost um, in that system? And, and obviously the consequences of things like the Doran Review, granted in special schools, you know, this is a different sort of trend of thought, but just an observation for this morning to say children with disabilities is a hugely important area that can't be lost. Thanks very much for that, James. So for the panel then, can we ask the question, Did the is the promise not adequately dealt with the area of provision for children with a disability? And what can we do to make sure that that, that, um, that area is, is clearly well covered? So I'm going to ask both Joanna and John. Um, can I go to Joanna first, please? And then John will come to you next, thanks. Thanks very much, and it's um, an absolutely excellent question. Um, and um, Jane mentioned at the beginning when she was giving her speech around the plan, the plan which is um, beside my bed, which is something that is critically important to what we do. Is a it's a brief plan deliberately, so it doesn't cover everything in detail. Um, and within the Scottish government, there really is, and elsewhere, obviously, a real commitment to um, supporting children with disabilities. But for me, one of the most important lines in the plan um, to deliver the promise is that for us to keep the promise, it will mean that love is no longer the casualty of the care system, but the value around which it operates. And I think it's really important for us in thinking about families with children with disabilities, who we all know that from when their child is born or develops a disability, they're worried. They're worried about what's going to happen. They're worried about what's going to happen to them when they grow up. They're worried about the constant campaigning they have to do at times to access services um, and their reputations around that. Um, and there's a comment in this morning's chat around the transitions. I, I think that's a critical area and we're, we're really focused on that um, within the government as well, that link between children and adult services. Um, but they're not absolutely not forgotten. Um, and I, I'll take on board around we need to be talking about them more um, because they're, they're a critical, a critical um, part of our communities. But more importantly, the value that we should be demonstrating through the promise, should, through GERFIT, through all the work we're doing, should be reflecting the value that anyone with a disability brings to the system um, and what, what they can inform us. And going back to um, Annie's comments as well, 
children and adults with disabilities must must be influencing the support that they're receiving and how and when they're receiving that support. Um, so thank you for raising that because it's a really important um, um, question, James, um, and take on board that we need to be talking more within the government around that. Thanks, Joanna. John, if I could bring you in on the same point, please. Yeah, and it's really interesting because I was when we, we, we looked like we were struggling for a question there, I was going to point out that earlier there had been a question about transition and I thought it was a really interesting one. So the fact that James brought it up is, is, is excellent. And a lot of what jo Joanna said, I absolutely agree with. I think fundamentally there is a real challenge around children with disabilities or those families where children have a disability and how we support those families. And I don't think we've got that particularly well covered for a long time. But we've had improvements and we've had knockbacks and we've had challenges. I think for me, the couple of things, again, it goes back to the rights based approach. So there's a human rights issue that we need to begin to think about, about what are the rights in terms of the kinds of services that children with disabilities require. There's the bit about, I think in children's services, we are not as well developed around um, self-directed support as we are in some areas of, of adult world, and we could probably do more. There's also the bit about families often get a bit of respite when children are at school and therefore the kind of challenges that they experience is different. The summer is a big, big problem out of weekends and out of hours. So I think we need to give some thought to that. And then the transition from children to adults becomes very difficult because for almost, you know, 40 weeks in the year or 35 weeks in the year, you're at school and suddenly you're out of school and you're not and families are looking for a safety and security for their children at that particular point. But one of the conversations I have with parents locally in Renfrewshire is about the rights of the child to try things that are different and that we can't wrap the children entirely in cotton and wool because that's what the parent believes is, is required at that particular point of transition, that we need to give the young adult the opportunity to take risks and grow. And that then goes back to what we do in children's social work and children's services around education, about how do we help a young person grow up? Because if you're a teenager who doesn't have a disability, you get lots of opportunities, you get let, let, lots of options, you're able to take risks. And we still, I think, wrap our children with disabilities in a bit of cotton wool. And we need to step back from that and think, what are the right risks? You don't want to put them in danger but what are the right risks? How do we help those children direct what they themselves want to do? And I'll give you an example. I, I spent um, a couple of years as head of early years and inclusion in Renfrewshire and ran a, a summer scheme um, where the, the provider, a bit like Annie said, walked away because they found they couldn't do it. So we had to step in um, and I met some incredible young people um, and we took some real risks about what we did. We, we actually used some of the young people to help other young people in the service to, to play sport because they could do that. They could demonstrate those skills. And a few of the young people actually gained uh, qualifications uh, in sport uh, and leisure as part of the programme. It had never happened before. So I think we do need to give uh, that wider uh, issue, but we need to address the fear and the anxiety that parents have. And, and I'll finish there. Thanks, Jennifer. Thanks very much, John. So, John. Some really, really interesting points there for us to think about. So we are almost out of time, folks. Uh, I know that Cleland's keen to come in. So Cleland, if you wouldn't mind, um, I'll come to you to make some final points. And then uh, I think we'll have to wrap up, unfortunately. Uh, so over to you, Cleland. I'll tread very uh, gently into a professional territory here. It's just there's a couple of comments around this uh, general debate. Um, firstly, uh, um, treating children with disabilities as a group is, a, is an inappropriate lens. Um, there are a wide range of needs, different, um, and in particular, just to pick up on the questioner's point, um, quite often we're conflating the needs associated with autism with the needs uh, associated with cognitive learning disability. And there is a bit of an overlap sometimes, but we need to ensure that we've got an appropriate focus on the um, different needs of those individual young people. The um, personalization of the responses around those. Um, John's point around the SDS it was one I was going to make is simply that we need to uh, uh, catch up to some extent in terms of the progress that's been made in, in an adult world. And actually, John, you must have been reading my notes upside down. The, the, the other point I was going to make here is if you look at um, the risk thresholds we've got for older persons, for example, and how that's changed over the last 20, 30 years, 
and compare that with um, disability, we are still uh, holding um, the risk tolerance at an extremely low level. Um, and actually, one of my reflections is how much of that risk tolerance is actually associated with the families or the carers as opposed to the individuals, which constrains how we then respond to the needs and aspirations, um, life aspirations of um, children and young adults with disability. But I, I, I know we're short of time, so I'll stop there. Thanks. Thanks very much, Cleland. Um, we are just about out of time. Julie, do you want to sneak in a very brief point? Thanks. Okay, we'll allow you to, since, since you're my boss. It's very brief. Um, just to say, this session could have been all the time, if not more. Um, and if there's interest from the panel and the attendees today, we could have another session like this and give people more of a, an opportunity to ask and have their questions answered, because I think probably we, we have, we've We've cut it a bit fine, Jennifer, so that if people are interested, maybe they can let me know. I think I think that would be a great solution, Julie, certainly. And there's, there's quite a few questions now coming through in the chat box, which what, what we can do is we can pose them to the panel um, and ask people to respond and do that in writing, but better still, another session would be, would be ideal. So we can go away and look at that and we'll figure out a way to address the questions that you're putting up um, one way or another. Um, so just generally, I'd like to thank everybody very, very much for their contributions this morning. Um, I think what's coming across quite clearly to me certainly is that there is a real enthusiasm and, um, and, and, and support for change to do things better amongst this group and, uh, and those who are joining in the chat this morning. We don't agree exactly how to go about that yet. That is the challenge that's ahead of us, but I think that's going to be some really interesting and robust discussions and um, I'm sure we all look forward to having that in a bit more detail. So thank you all very, very much for your contribution, both for our attendees and our panel members.